this is Rob Swatsky from the York campus of Harrisburg Area Community College in York, Pennsylvania. In this podcast, we are continuing our review of the bones and bony landmarks of the axial skeleton. I'm going to focus on two of the cranial bones, the occipital bone and the sphenoid bone. The occipital bone is the cranial bone located at the back of the head. It forms the posterior and most of the base of the cranium. From this posterior view, you can see how the occipital bone fuses with the two parietal bones here at the lambdoid suture. This suture is referred to as lambdoid because its shape resembles the Greek letter lambda, which resembles an upside down letter V. Our first structure on the occipital bone is the foramen magnum, which literally means big hole. It's located on the inferior occipital bone, and it's the region where the medulla oblongata of the brain, which is the brain stem, connects with the spinal cord. And like many of these foramina, the foramen magnum also allows passage of the vertebral and spinal arteries along with the accessory nerve, which is cranial nerve 11. Located on both sides of the foramen magnum are round processes known as the occipital condyles. These have shallow, convex grooves that articulate with the atlas, which is the first cervical vertebra, C1. Together, the occipital condyles and the atlas form the atlanto-occipital joint. This joint allows us to nod our heads up and down in the yes motion. Now, with your fingers, reach to the back of your head and feel the bump located just above your neck. That is known as the external occipital protuberance. It's an attachment point for the ligamentum nuchae which connects to the seventh cervical vertebra, C7, to help support the head. Our last two bony landmarks on the occipital bone are the superior and inferior nuchal lines. These are two pairs of curved ridges that serve as areas of muscle attachment. Our next cranial bone is the sphenoid bone, and this is located in the middle part of the base of the skull, it's really firmly embedded within the skull. It's considered to be this major keystone bone of the cranial floor because it joins together with all of the other cranial bones. It joins on its anterior side with the frontal and ethmoid bones. It joins laterally with the temporal bones. And it joins on its posterior side with the occipital bone. It's located just posterior to the nasal cavity and also forms part of the floor, sidewalls, and rear walls of the orbit of the eye. Its shape is very unique. It resembles a moth or a bat in flight with its wings outstretched. It has a number of distinct bony landmarks and foramina. The body of the sphenoid bone is this box-like medial portion found between the ethmoid and occipital bones. In this body is a hollowed space called the sphenoidal sinus, which drains into the nasal cavity. On the superior surface of the body is a saddle-shaped structure called the cella tersica, and use this as a key landmark to locate the other bony structures and the foramina. The cella tersica resembles a Turkish saddle, which has a backrest. The tuberculum celli is the anterior bumpy ridge on the cella tersica that forms the horn of the saddle. The dorsum celli is the posterior part of the cella tersica that forms the backrest. The seat-like depression of the saddle is the hypophysial fossa located in the middle of the cella tersica. You may be wondering who is the rider sitting in this saddle? It is none other than the pituitary gland, with the hypophysial fossa containing and protecting this very important gland at the base of the brain. The greater wings are the large lateral projections extending out from the body. They form the anterolateral floor of the cranium, as well as part of the lateral wall of the skull, just anterior to the temporal bone. 
The lesser wings are the small bony ridges located anterior and superior to the greater wings. These form part of the cranial floor as well as the posterior orbit. The sphenoid bone is home to many foramina. The optic foramen, also known as the optic canal, is located anteriorly on the sphenoid bone between the body and lesser wings, just in front of the cella tersica. It allows the optic nerve, which is cranial nerve two, and the ophthalmic artery to pass into the orbit. The other opening located nearby is the superior orbital fissure. This is a triangular slit between the greater and lesser wings. It allows passage of some of the cranial nerves as well as blood vessels. The foramen rotundum is located where the anterior and medial sphenoid bone meets. Rotundum means round hole, and this foramen allows passage of the maxillary branch of the trigeminal nerve, which is cranial nerve five. The foramen ovale are located towards the posterior of the greater wing. This oval hole has a very distinct shape and should also be used as a landmark to locate the other foramina. It allows passage of the mandibular branch of the trigeminal nerve. Also in the greater wing and just lateral to the foramen ovale are the smallest of the foramina called the foramen spinosum. These tiny spiny openings allow passage of blood vessels to the meninges surrounding the central nervous system. Our last foramen is the foramen lacerum, and this is not a round hole or an oval opening. This is more of a slash or a tear. Lacerum, a reference to its lacerated appearance. This foramen is sandwiched in between the sphenoid occipital and temporal bones, and it allows passage of one of the branches of the ascending pharyngeal artery. And our final bony landmark of the sphenoid bone are the legs of the bat. These are known as the pterygoid processes. These project inferiorly from the body and greater wings and form the lateral posterior nasal cavity. They're also the points of attachment for several muscles that move the mandible. Thanks for watching. I hope you found this podcast helpful. Stay tuned for more reviews of the bones and bony landmarks of the axial skeleton.